In early 1758, the Austrian camp had no cause for celebration. In September, the year before, Prince Charles commanded up to 90,000 soldiers. By winter, these melted to under 30,000 with over 40,000 soldiers taken prisoner and countless numbers of baggage, provisions and weaponry lost. Despite the enormous setback, loss of face and the reluctance of their French ally to contribute any troops directly against Prussia, Maria Theresa was not ready to make peace just yet. Whoever hinted at making peace at court during that winter faced a tirade of Count Kaunitz who considered Prussia's destruction his personal mission. After so many disasters in battle, Prince Charles was finally relieved of command. General Nadashti, Zetan's worthy nemesis, retired in anger at the court intrigues. Marshal Dawn replaced Charles. His army was augmented thanks to the massive conscription campaigns held in Hungary and Croatia, the favorable amnesty policy for deserters and even prisoner exchanges with the Prussians. A pandemic and a harsh winter forced the Austrian army to be in a dire strait by spring 1758. It was not all doom and gloom for the Austrian Empress though. The Russian Empress was like-minded when it came to Prussia's destruction. After Marshal Apraxin's withdrawal from East Prussia at the Battle of Großjägersdorf the year before, she ordered his court-martial and she appointed General Firmer in his place. By midwinter January 1758, the Russian army crossed into East Prussia. Generously subsidized, Firmer's army numbered 80,000 by spring. His goal was to seize Brandenburg or even Silesia. Britain was meant to send a fleet to the Baltic against the Russians and soldiers to Hanover to strengthen the Western Front. In the event, they did neither. Instead, Frederick learned of Firmer's advance in the duchy while simultaneously receiving news from France that King Louis did not want to open any negotiations. Whereas Austria's army was in poor condition, Prussia was arguably in a worse state. Sure, they had won two great victories, but many soldiers were killed and wounded and even more died thanks to the same epidemic which also hit the Austrians. Officers tried to recruit many new recruits from outside German principalities, Swedish Pomerania, Saxony and Mecklenburg. Prussia's finances were nothing to write home about either. 1757 had cost Prussia around 31 million thaler. To subsidize the New Year's worth of campaigning, Frederick launched a campaign to squeeze Saxony, impose forced loans on Breslau merchants and Jesuit institutions, and of course, England subsidized him with another 5 million. Combined, this was enough to sustain his army for the initial campaigning at least. Now, it wasn't Frederick, but it was his brother-in-law, Prince Ferdinand of Brunswick, who opened the 1758 campaign. Commanding a Prussian Hanoverian army, Brunswick launched a lightning campaign. First, he pushed the French army commanded by Louis de Bourbon, the Count of Clermont, across the Rhine. This allowed Frederick to concentrate on the Austrians. Conjuring up an ambitious strategy, he wanted to invade Moravia via Silesia. He planned to lay siege to Olmütz, the final stronghold before Vienna, then push the Austrians back to Austria before moving against Prague and the Russians. In April, Frederick collected half his army and embarked on a march towards Neisse. Marshal James Keith followed at a distance to deceive the Austrians. Zieten remained at Landeshut and another army at Glatz. From Neisse, Frederick began his march. By May 11, he reached Olmütz virtually uncontested. But it wasn't until May 29 that the first bombardments of the siege began. Logistics-wise, it became painfully obvious the Prussians were understaffed and under-equipped. The fortress was stocked up on food and ammunition, with solid walls garrisoned by 8,500 energetic defenders and 324 guns. Frederick's hope was for the Austrians to attempt to relieve the city. He would force Dawn into a large battle, where he would hopefully beat them, seize Olmutz, and become an acute danger to Vienna. In the event, none of these things ever happened. 
Dawn was slow to march to Olmutz's relief, but that was no bother for the Prussians quickly ran behind on schedule. Frederick hoped to own the fortress by mid-June, but the second delivery of big guns only arrived around that time. By late June the supply line issues became painfully obvious and Dawn was closing in. Frederick was none the wiser thanks to the protective screen of Austrian irregulars preventing any scouting outposts. These flocks of irregulars also posed a significant threat to small supply convoys. As Ormuz was weakening, this final artillery batch would prove the decisive blow. Surely one large column, well defended by many soldiers, was safer for transport than all the small columns subject to constant harassment. Frederick began organizing the logistics for such a convoy to depart. And intelligence reached the Austrians of the plan, but frankly the column was enormous to the degree the Austrians could not have missed it. 4,000 wagons filled with ammunition, weaponry, provisions, gunpowder and large artillery escorted by 8 battalions of infantry. Major General Gideon von Loudon embarked to intercept it. Frederick, suspecting the convoy was a prime target, dispatched Zeton to defend it as well. The Prussian convoy departed from Bouch on the morning of June 28. Besides 4,000 wagons, 2,500 head of cattle traveled along as well, protected by nearly 11,000 soldiers, 1,341 cavalry, and eight infantry battalions, mainly comprised of levied recruits and recently recovered veterans. The column's total length was over 45 kilometers. The roads were in very poor condition. Loudon shared command with General Josef von Ziskovic. Loudon positioned himself at Gundersdorf. He commanded around 6,000 men, four infantry battalions, some dragoons, hussars, and an artillery battery. This would not be enough to face the Prussians. Siskovic got lost on his way to Gundersdorf and his army ended up somewhere between Herlsdorf and Nuremberg to the south. But disregarding Siskovic's absence, when the convoy approached, Loudon decided there was no time to waste and launched an attack. The column's advance guard tracked towards the village when Austrian infantry and artillery opened fire. Lieutenant Colonel von Mosel mounted a spirited defense. A prolonged firefight between infantry and artillery continued, with the Prussians unable to advance toward the city and the Austrians unable to inflict decisive damage. Eventually, outnumbered and not seeing any opportunities, Loudon retreated towards Barn. Due to the lack of cavalry, the Prussians did not launch a pursuit. After a few hours, Zeton arrived with his corps. Reinforcing the column, they took their time to repair the damage. They outnumbered Loudon after all. On the morning of June 13, they re-embarked on their march, confident they would repel Loudon's attacks since he did not outnumber them. But in the background, the Austrians had prepared a second attack. Siskovic, who got lost in the woods, finally took position between Herlsdorf and Nuremberg. Sprinkled with hills and woods, it was ideal for his infantry to hide. Loudon moved to the south from Barn. When the Prussian vanguard of nearly 5,000 soldiers and 250 wagons passed, Siskovic ordered his men to lay dormant. The main body following was their prime target. Once the vanguard of the army passed, the artillery on the hills opened a deafening volley of fire. South of Neudorfel, Battle cries shook the main Prussian column. Artillery lit up the column while Austrian infantry launched volleys of fire. Prussian infantry defending the baggage train hastened to protect whatever they could. Savage fighting broke out. The Prussians fiercely resisted, but then, on the other side of the convoy, they heard a terrible sound. From the north, Loudon descended on the Prussians. Zeton's corps manned this part of the line, and his hussars launched a countercharge against Loudon's soldiers. Heavy combat broke out, but the panic was too widespread. Despite a spirited defense, Zeton's cavalry was bested, and the entire convoy deteriorated into a rout. 
upon seeing the carnage to their north. The Prussian infantry fighting Siskovich broke as well. Zitin's hussars retreated towards Tropau, to the northeast. Many Prussians were captured, and many scattered in the hills and the woods. The Austrians seized over 3,000 loaded wagons, 2,200 horses, 2 million thalers, and 12 heavy cannons, losing only 680 men. They packed everything they could carry on their baggage train and they burned the rest. Besides their valuable artillery and the supply convoy, the Prussians lost between 2,300 and 2,700 men. Of the 250 wagons in the vanguard, only 100 reached Olmutz by midnight. Besides the wagons, remnants of battered infantry battalions and a handful of cavalry squadrons arrived. Lieutenant General Anton von Kokov relayed to Frederick how most of the 9,000 strong escort was last seen in wild retreat towards Truppau. Frederick received the news with commendable stoicism. He ordered James Keith to lift the siege, collected his soldiers, and he organized a retreat back into Silesia. In July, he set up camp at Königgratz, hoping Dawn would attack him. But the Austrian field marshal knew the Russian threat was approaching in the east. He did not need to wage battle against Frederick now, with Olmutz safe from any Prussian threat. Dawn's patience would be rewarded soon enough when the enormous allied Russian army arrived. The Battle of Zorndorf drew near, one of the most iconic battles of the entire Seven Years' War. Thank you so much for watching this video. If there is a person, topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, please let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just one dollar a month you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements and your name will be featured at the end of every video don't forget to subscribe see you next time